Kokos, the mysterious treasure island in the Pacific, a pristine paradise both on land and in the sea. Its fascinating underwater world with its unique diversity of marine life is a perennial magnet for scientists and diving tourists. A school of jacks pursued by hungry sharks. For them, this is ideal territory for hunting and mating. The big predators are the undisputed rulers of this isolated mountain realm in the ocean. Our journey to Cocos Island starts in Central America, in Costa Rica. It takes us 300 nautical miles out to sea, to the tip of a Pacific volcano thrusting 640 meters out of the water. With an area of 25 square kilometers, this is considered the largest uninhabited rainforest island in the world. Sheer rock faces make access so difficult that some parts of the island have still not been explored. Cocos has never had direct contact with the mainland, so it has a wealth of endemic flora and fauna, species that exist nowhere else in the world. In the tropical jungle, the air is hot and humid, the result of daily downpours. Annual precipitation at 8,000 millimeters is 10 times higher than in Germany. At many points on the mountain's flanks, water plunges from great heights. Countless streams rush through the inland gorges, for centuries a source of fresh drinking water for fishermen, pirates, and ship's crews on long voyages. An oasis in the ocean, shrouded in myth and legend, even today. This is the place that inspired the 19th century Scottish author, Robert Louis Stevenson, to write the novel Treasure Island. Since then, countless treasure hunting expeditions have set sail for Cocos, but all have left empty-handed. Instead of gold and silver, the volcanic island has other treasures to offer, especially underwater. After 36 hours at sea, at times in pleasant company, our ocean-going ship, the Sea Hunter, approaches its destination. The captain slows the engines. So this is it, our treasure island. Moving cautiously over rocks and reefs close to the surface, the ship proceeds towards the island and gives everyone on board plenty of time to take in the scenery. A tropical island, but with none of the customary palm-fringed beaches, Every movement of the ship opens up a new vista. This steep coastline has no sheltered bays to offer. Our ship is constantly exposed to the swell. The crew have their hands full, lowering the anchor and mooring the ship as securely as possible. Not everyone on deck has to work. Niels has found a few books in the ship's library about earlier expeditions to the treasure island stories of fortune hunters and legends of pirates' hordes. Even a US president came here. Franklin D. Roosevelt took part in several expeditions, and he was only one of many. On land, many of their names are chiseled into a stone guest book. Nearly every boulder is covered in them.
Jacques Cousteau called Cocos the most beautiful island in the world. Some entries in the guest book date way back. Today, it's strictly forbidden to explore the island alone. Access is permitted only to small, clearly designated areas. There are no paths or tracks into the rainforest, much to the disappointment of all those who dream of hidden treasure from pirate ships or once rich churches. On board the Sea Hunter, a land expedition is being prepared. The crew lower the launches into the water. The biologists on board are not the only ones excited. The planned excursion is to an offshore bird rock. One inquisitive local has already come aboard. The volcanic outcrop Manuelita rises over a hundred meters out of the water. Its sheer sides inhibit access and make it a safe outpost for nesting seabirds. Conservationists from Costa Rica want to check the size of the colony. The boobies show no fear of humans. After a few lean years, they now have all they need to raise their young. In the waters around the island, there are again plenty of sardines. Expeditions to bird colonies invariably include the risk of being bombarded with bird excreta, but it doesn't deter the ornithologists from going about their work. Sometimes they even have to disturb the birds to check whether a nest contains eggs or chicks. The adult seems a bit unsettled, but doesn't leave the eggs. Only the red-footed booby builds a proper nest in trees and bushes. The yellow-footed brown booby hatches its eggs on the ground. The two species have staked a claim to the entire offshore rock. On the cliffs of the main island, other fish hunters have set up home, frigate birds. During the mating season, the males inflate their bright red throat sac to attract the attention of the females. For a passing female frigate bird, the sack evidently has a magnetic attraction. He's achieved what he wants. She moves into his nest. But vigilance is vital. There are rivals all around. Only after mating can the red throat sack be safely deflated. At only two points on the island, freshwater streams have created a short pebble beach, a favorite feeding ground for herons. The large birds must have flown here from the mainland. This one seems to have little experience of such marine creatures as octopuses. As both a national park and a UNESCO World Heritage Site, Cocos is permanently guarded. The park rangers are the island's only human residents. There are no overnight facilities for tourists and tight restrictions on visits by ship's passengers. Because of daily feeding, small finches are permanent guests at the ranger station. An endemic species, they differ strikingly from their mainland cousins in terms of leg length and wingspan. Due to the island's total isolation, they've taken a different route along the evolutionary trail. The 
This species of lizard is also only found here. Off this stretch of coast, visitors are fairly free to decide where they go, provided they stick to the rules and dive only within the areas selected by the expedition leader. We want to go to Alcyon, okay? Alcyon is a sea mount. On board, a diving instructor briefs the group on the next dive. It's about 85 feet deep, the shallowest point, about 25 meters. Meanwhile, on the bridge, the dive site coordinates are entered into the GPS. On the way there, the ship needs to steer clear of many rock formations rising to just under the surface. The Sea Hunter's owner is familiar with the waters around Kokos and maneuvers us safely to a group of rock needles. Their shape indicates the kind of landscape that awaits us underwater. The central sea mount that forms Cocos Island is fringed with rock pillars, which churn the surface currents and mix them with the plankton-rich water rising from the deep, hence the massive concentrations of fish. During the day, many fish seek safety in numbers, forming shoals so large and dense that they can hide an entire rock wall. For species like the blue-striped snapper, the mountain offers not just food, but also caves and hiding places galore. Chances of survival here are evidently good, otherwise the place wouldn't be so crowded. While the small marine animals huddle together, occasional loners, like moray eels, squeeze into cracks in the rock to stay safe from bigger predators. The only reason they're opening their mouths here is to breathe. A group of Moorish idols grazing the algae-covered slope undisturbed. Their bright colors persuade predators that they're poisonous. Between rock slopes that rise almost to the surface, we find marbled rays in matrimonial mood. A female is courted by two males. Elsewhere in the world, rays prefer a flat, sandy seabed. Here at Cocos, they've adapted to the volcanic landscape. They also show no fear of divers. Like their flat cousins, fast, agile reef sharks have also found hunting grounds among the rocks. and not only hunting grounds, but resting places as well. When sharks rest in large groups, there has to be a reason. And the reason is body care. Small, cleaner gobies free the large predators from parasites and dead skin, even in places that look pretty risky. But the cleaners' lives are not in danger. They have an agreement with the sharks. One party gets cleaned, the other gets to feed in safety. And despite the huge difference in size, the arrangement between host and cleaner seems to work well. While the shark rests, the gobies provide a full grooming and pest control service. It's a service that's in high demand. Sometimes the sharks have to queue to be served. But rest periods can be abruptly terminated. 
because sharks have extremely sensitive sense organs for smell, they can detect a potential mate a long way off. The males leave their resting places. As if in response to a secret signal, they home in on the female. It's still not fully known how female sharks signal their availability for breeding. It's assumed they release pheromones into the water, substances that trigger a sexual response. As soon as that happens, the females are pursued, often by a number of males. Here, Cocos Island offered a rare opportunity to film sharks mating. In contrast to the spawning rituals of most fish, a shark wedding is a genuine coupling and a brutal looking business. Two males engage a female, sinking teeth into her fins and flanks until one of them succeeds in mating. Waters packed with plankton also attract more docile species of shark. The biggest fish in the ocean, the whale shark. These giants don't have classic shark teeth. They don't need them because they don't eat fish. Their prey is plankton tiny organisms that rise on the currents in massive quantities at Cocos Island. While the whale shark continues to follow the bountiful current, a glance at the surface shows the weather is turning bad. This is not unusual for Cocos Island. Nowhere else gets so much rain. It averages 8,000 millimeters a year, which is 10 times more than in Germany. Filming underwater is difficult in lighting conditions like this. But the weather goes well with the precipitous landscape. The dive team returns right on time for lunch. But there's no time for a longer break. Preparations need to be made for the next dive. All the cameras have to be washed to remove the salt water, then loaded with fresh film and memory chips. When everything's done, the film team sets off for one of the most exciting dives of the trip. Hugging the coastline, the dive boat heads for one of the submarine mountains, some way from the spot where we are anchored. The sheer cliffs are an extension of the landscape underwater. A free fall straight into the territory of hungry reef sharks. They're evidently out hunting. Smaller reef dwellers seek refuge in narrow crevices in the rock. But not every hiding place is safe from these restless predators. They check every single hole in the wall. The tip of an underwater needle makes a good vantage point. Suddenly, a new and bigger shape appears among the reef sharks, a hammerhead. Is it alone or one of a group? No sooner is the question asked than it's answered. Out of the blue water comes a whole armada of powerful, scalloped hammerhead sharks.
They're a weird sight, with eyes and nostrils at each end of a grotesquely extended brow. It's assumed that the hammer-like shape of the head increases the shark's maneuverability, while the wider spacing of the eyes makes for better 3D vision. Scientists think these schools disperse at night and return to Cocos only at dawn, guided by the magnetic field created in the seabed by old lava flows. That lightning reaction was probably triggered by a tiny signal imperceptible to a human being. The sharks pick up such signals with special, highly developed sense organs on their head and the sides of their body. Some hammerheads regularly leave the group and come here to have their wounds tended by butterfly fish. The shark's attention is evidently caught by the cleaner's advertising. The butterfly fish swim out to the prospective client with no apparent fear. Almost all the sharks that come for cleaning are female, in need of treatment for the scars and wounds inflicted by males in rough sexual encounters. The extra slow body movements are a signal that there's nothing to fear. The request is quickly understood. The body care team is joined by more and more butterfly fish. When the last hammerheads leave the mountain, we also swim out into the blue water. Above us, cutting through the rising columns of our air bubbles, peaceful mantas glide past. Encounters with mantas are a fascinating experience for any diver. But while pictures like this are now familiar, there are still significant gaps in our knowledge of the animal's life cycle in the Pacific. They seem to play with the divers, pulling alongside them for several seconds and showing themselves from all sides in their full majestic splendor. As quietly as they arrived, they slip away again into the open ocean. Every day at Cocos Island held new surprises. Today, it's a swarm of black frigate birds circling low over the water. The pirates of the air can neither dive nor swim. Here, they're picking up easy prey from a school of fish driven to the surface by sharks. The young jacks panic. Corralled by silky sharks and tuna in the water, and by seabirds in the air, the school is trapped. No matter how superior the large predators may be, they have never posed a serious threat to the biodiversity of the waters around Cocos Island. If fish stocks in the Eastern Pacific are increasingly threatened, it's entirely because of commercial fishermen who drag nets and lay long lines even through protected areas like this.
Fishermen often explain their presence by saying they have a problem with their engines, which can only be repaired in the lee of the island. In many cases, however, they're just pirate fishing, flaunting the fishing and anchor bands in the national park and its buffer zone off the coast. They're attracted by the large numbers of sharks. Their fins alone fetch fabulous prices in Asian markets. Silky sharks are particularly targeted. This silver tip managed to get away with a broken pectoral fin. A long line has drifted and become entangled on the wall. Our divers retrieve it and will later hand it to the park rangers. He was lucky. He was able to tear the hook off the line. Now the park wardens have a patrol boat, they can control pirate fishing much more effectively and have confiscated many illegal long lines. But they still lack a radar for monitoring the 20 mile zone at night. We draw alongside the patrol boat. In the bows is the long line we found on the wall. Now it will be put to a better use, helping to provide an earthquake-proof suspension bridge for the ranger station. Earthquake-proofing is important here because Cocos Island is on a particularly active tectonic plate, one that's pushing under the Caribbean continental plate at a rate of seven centimeters a year. The result is seismic and volcanic activity. In the worst case scenario, even tsunamis. Our next descent will take us to much greater depths than we have reached so far. The Sea Hunter has a modern research submarine on board and it's now being made ready for its next mission. Everyone involved needs to be informed about every stage. The seven-ton deep sea is hitched to a crane and lifted into a floating frame. The pilot explains where the sub is going to dive. We're going to dive on the three locations that we found here. The first one is going to be uh, the sea mount at, at around 100 uh, meter. And uh, then we're going to proceed down to 200 meters to the wall, to the edge that we found, the break in the cocos plate. And then we're going to proceed deeper into uh, the abyss to 300 and uh, 450 meters. This is the area which we find most of the unusual creatures and the unidentified. Every dive that we're going down, there's a big chance to find something that we haven't seen before, uh, things that nobody knows about. And even if people know about them, they haven't seen them in their natural habitat. The deep sea is ready for boarding. Pilot and cameraman take their seats in the cramped glass dome. The Sea Hunter team includes specialized maintenance operatives for the sub. With a practiced hand, they now get it ready for towing. Faster than anticipated, the deep sea is towed into position by the support boat. The sea is calm. The sub rides low in the water thanks to batteries and ballast. Even in a rough sea, the trip off the north coast of the island is not all that uncomfortable. The canvas cover is removed. The sub is ready to dive. Okay, very good. Okay. The first few minutes underwater are spent checking equipment, the camera, the radio, the instruments. Down to the 40 meter mark, we're escorted outside by a second cameraman. The water is clear, the glass dome freshly cleaned, a good opportunity for filming the filmers.
Then the rapid descent commences. The diver can't follow us further down. Yeah, I have the, uh, I have the Everest on my sonar just in front of me, around, as you said, uh, I would say 200 feet, 200 feet in front of us. Everest is a recently discovered submarine mountain, which we'll pass at a depth of 100 meters. On the crest of the mountain, a school of jacks. Where so many fish live, there are bound to be predators as well. Finally, one of them makes an appearance, the deep sea shark we've been hoping to see. A little known species related to the gray nurse shark, this one is about four meters long. The sub's battery power and air supply are good for about eight hours. Plenty of time yet to see what more the deep has to offer. From size and appearance, the research team identify a ragged tooth shark a species that normally lives at a depth of several hundred meters. Carrying on down to around 150 meters, we come to a typical geological feature of this area, a vertical slide scar. The sub's technical equipment allows us to hug the wall closely and identify even very small creatures. The number of fish has declined significantly, but where groupers are found, there are sure to be smaller fish. For example, careless antheas. The wall is a hive of activity. The sub's floodlights disturb brilliantly colored scorpion fish out hunting. Their markings work as camouflage only in darkness, allowing them to take small fish by surprise. At 150 meters, the perch-like species appear quite often. But at 200 meters, the bio-landscape changes. Fewer species, but more surprises. This bizarre-looking deep-sea fish, a member of the sea catfish family, has never been seen before at Cocos Island. Instead of wide ventral fins, it has long antennae that enable it to feel its way in the dark. We've arrived in the realm of deep-sea rarities. Above, below, and to the side, our eyes dart everywhere so as not to miss anything in the surrounding darkness. Like a bird of the night, a sicklefin devil ray glides past overhead. A close relation of the manta, it's on the lookout for plankton-rich deep-sea currents. At 270 meters, we pass a wall that has obviously been split by major seismic activity. A brief instrument check, then we cautiously continue our descent. Now we need to move more slowly. We set down on a plateau at 300 meters. Here we disturb a rare denizen of the deep, a spotted tail angler. Using its pectoral fins as legs, it can walk on the seabed. A stroke of luck. We seem to have run into a pair of anglers in the midst of a courtship ritual. We leave the plateau and drop to our planned maximum depth of 380 meters. A deep
deepwater bramble shark crosses our bows, probably more than three meters long. Even today, very little is known about this shark's life history. It's thought to be a live-bearing species which feeds on crabs, bony fishes, and other sharks. Its eyes are of little help in the darkness of the deep. Like most sharks, it depends on special receptor cells in its head and flanks to find its way around. It's only a few weeks since the deep sea team sighted this species for the very first time at Cocos Island. The sub's batteries are now getting low, so we let the shark move on and prepare to ascend to the surface, stirring up sediment in the process. All status lights are very good, so we're leaving and we're coming up. It's dark when we surface. The supply boat quickly takes us in tow. After five hours in deep sea, there's just time for a short break on the brightly lit Sea Hunter before German dive master Tobias Meinken announces a special thrill. This is a dive we look only at the sharks. They work together with black jacks. Uh, big fish like this. It's about dark olive greenish, and those are very good and efficient hunters. Sooner or later, the whole shark school will follow those jacks. And then when the jack has something inside that he wants to eat, he lays flat on the side and then speeds off like a rocket ship. When he gets the fish he wanted, in that moment the chase is over, and then he starts looking for a new one. If he doesn't get it, then he chases usually the little fish into the rocks, and that's when the white to reef sharks come in, because then they stick all the heads into the rock huh? and try to get the little fish out there. Even before we're in the water, familiar shapes glide past. No day without sharks, and no night either. Even with our powerful lamps, our range of vision is limited. We need to be prepared for surprises at any time. The agitation of the reef sharks is immediately apparent. Constantly searching for prey, they nevertheless show no interest in the turtle. Their food of choice is fish. Others, too, have no need to fear the sharks. This hermit crab, for example, in its thick shell. Even full-grown crayfish can leave their hiding places at night. They're not on the list of prey for these sharks. But there are other predators out and about as well. Marbled rays are specialized bottom feeders. The mantis shrimp spots the danger too late. The ray covers the hole with its body and digs out the shrimp with its mouth. The sound of feeding alerts the sharks nearby, but the ray refuses to surrender its catch. The pace of the hunt steps up. The pack gets wilder. Any fish that hasn't found a safe place to hide yet is not likely to escape the hungry mob. Electro-receptors on the predator's snouts detect movement in the reef. The frantic scramble for fish seems endless, and it gets more and more frenzied. Some potential prey are simply lucky. 
Even our lights don't harm their chances because sharks don't use their eyes to detect prey. Some small fish manage to find cracks too narrow for the predators to follow. Even in open water, there's a chance of surviving. The shark's electroreceptors often don't pick up a signal until the prey is just centimeters away. But not everyone has luck on its side. That was close. The camera in the middle of a tangle of frenzied sharks. Lucky that the mob moved on. Diving at night can be fascinating, but also dangerous. At any rate, here at Shark Mountain. A new day begins. Peace and quiet returns to the underwater world. Schooling jacks and packs of sharks seem oblivious of each other's presence. It appears that everyone got enough to eat during the night. After the wild hunt, the predators are understandably tired. At the foot of a steep slope, they stretch out on the soft, sandy bottom. And though resting, they start gasping for breath, because while they're not swimming, water doesn't stream automatically through their gills. The sharks now have to breathe actively. At rest, they no longer look like brutal nocturnal predators. Even potential prey knows the sharks are not in the mood for hunting now. This isolated mountain in the Pacific, far off the coast of Costa Rica, is now a picture of peace, at least until tonight.